Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Annie Haas, and I am the co-lead for the Incubate Energy Program and Incubate Energy Labs Program at the Electric Power Research Institute. So, um, really excited you're joining us for this first Lunch and Learn of 2021. We're going to try to do these once a month to highlight some of the cool projects that have come out of the Incubate Energy Labs Challenge. And the, the program is really designed to bridge the gap um, among startups, utilities, and the R&D space to really look at how we can collaboratively and rapidly demonstrate um, innovative new products, technologies, and services, and then help to really scale those up within the utility industry. So uh, each startup that is selected as part of our program works collaboratively with, collaboratively with every R&D experts and um, our utilities that are part of the program to really scope and shape a demonstration that can be completed in 16 weeks and give us some really good early insights into the potentials for these technologies. So, with that said, um, this project that, that you'll hear about today was really uh, uh, one of my favorites of our 2020 cohort last year. If so many of us had to do, um, you know, we, we got these folks on board and then it was a pivot because of COVID. Um, and so it was a unique project for EPRI. We actually, the demonstration was done um, in Vancouver. Uh, five of our great utilities supported that, Ameren, American Electric Power, Con Edison, Southern California Edison, and Tennessee Valley Authority all uh, provided support for this work. And, and then, you know, everybody kind of shares in those results. Um, so um, of note, I just wanted to call out a few few folks on the line today. You'll hear from Lynn Mueller, um, CEO of Shark Energy Inventor of the product. You'll hear from some folks on his team. You'll also hear from Doug Lindsay, who is our project manager on this project at EPRI. He is with our uh, customer technologies group at EPRI. And then you'll also hear, for, hear from Sylvia Corum, um, who is an R&D uh, program manager at Con Edison. And there's some exciting stuff coming out of this demonstration project that Con Edison will be involved with. So thank you all again for joining us. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Lynn Mueller, President and CEO of Sharp Energy. Take it away, Lynn, thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Annie. And um, yeah, just to reiterate our, um, our wonderful involvement in the Incubate Energy uh, 2020 program. Um, we were uh, we were so fortunate to be able to work with uh, Doug and Annie and Hannah and the rest of the crew, Mark at um, EPRI and our utility sponsors, uh, Con Edison, TVA, Ameron, Southern Cal Edison, and American Electric. So, what it did was give us a unique opportunity to uh, to test out our Piranha HC unit. Then I'll explain later, but. When COVID hit, it sort of threw a wrench into everything as far as uh, doing installations on site within these utility districts. So we were able to uh, work with Doug and Annie and uh, line up a project in Vancouver that we could get to quite easily and, and do all the testing. And it's really funny because Shark was really concerned about the integrity of all the information, et cetera. So I think we kind of flooded poor Doug with information that um, maybe a little more than he needed, but but I'm very happy to be here today. And um, you probably tuned in because uh, you see just how glamorous the uh, sewage heat recovery world is. But you know, I, I'm doing my best to keep a level head in that glamorous surrounding. So I'll continue on. I started uh, I started the company. It was an idea I had. During a, a brief retirement stint, I had at home, and and um, I'd had a long career in the geothermal heat pump business, and um, I thought it would be great to spend a little time at home with my wife, and I should have probably talked to her first because three days into my plan, she sat, sat me down and suggested that I find something to do or a new place to live, so I was driving the poor woman crazy, and... Um, and so I'd started to, started to tear apart the kitchen. And so she hired a contractor to come in and fix, a, fix that mess up and told me to get to work. So, but the three days I was at home, I found out that at my house, I used about $1,200 a year worth of hot water. 
And I was thinking, gosh, if, if I'm using $1,200 a year and every house in the neighborhood's using $1,200 a year, and then, and then in the world, where, where is all that energy going? And, and I'm really a stingy beggar, so I wanted to find a way to get that energy back. And my parents lived through, uh, they homesteaded a farm in central Alberta during the Depression. So all I heard growing up is, you know, don't throw anything away. Reuse what you can. And being the youngest of six kids, uh, I always said, hand me down everything. You know, some of the dresses my sisters uh, hand me down didn't fit too well. But, but really, uh, you know, great experience as a family. We were, we were poor farmers in Alberta. And and I I had drilled into my head you don't throw anything away so the challenge of recovering all that energy that goes down the drain was really appealing to me on a lot of levels so in 2011 we introduced our first shark unit and then later on um, the shark unit becomes usable for larger projects the district energy etc. And then I wanted to get a, a unit in every building in the world, so I invented the Piranha unit. And then with the EPRI launch, we, we developed the Piranha HC unit, which uh, has an air conditioning feature. So while you're making high efficient electric hot water, you can also offer simultaneous air conditioning. So the value proposition for us was that everybody in the free world uses about 60 gallons of water a day for their you know, individual personal use during the day. And about 24 gallons of that is heated. So it makes up a very significant portion of the energy used in the world uh, for hot water, for things like showering and laundry and, and that sort of thing. So what, what our challenge was to get that energy back and get it back efficiently. And and if you see that all the uses are very predictable too. So the flows in the sewer lines are very predictable every day. And the great thing about the, the sewer lines in a city is there's only one administrator for the sewer lines. So you can easily access all that energy. And in the, <clears throat> in the world, there's about a trillion dollars worth of hot water that's put down the drain and, and thrown away forever. So we want to recover that and reuse it. And the second law of thermodynamic states that um, that heat moved from warmer to colder. And the first law states that energy can't be created or destroyed. So our system is very, very simple. Heat moves from warmer to colder and the energy is available all the time and can be reused in perpetuity. And if you look at a city like Vancouver, where I live here now, there's about uh, six or 700 million gallons a day of, of water that goes down the drains and um, is, has been warmed up about 30 degrees. So if you look at everybody in my neighborhood and the whole city's got $1,000 a year going down the drain, we can recover that. And what makes it a really good deal is that we're super efficient. So. We recover on average for domestic hot water at about 350%. So for every dollar you spend to recover the energy, you get $3.50 worth of green energy back. And that's in the form of hot water. So we have two products, like I said. The Piranha is for individual buildings. You can put it in and just recover all the energy you need for your domestic hot water usage. And what's really neat there is the, the load always matches the source because when you need hot water, you're using and it goes down the drain. And that's the source for the next batch of hot water we produce. So it becomes a perpetual cycle of reusing that energy at super efficiency. And everything we do offsets the use of gas boilers. So we uh, were green to boot. So, you know, you look at that little apartment building there. It's, uh, you know, you save about half a ton of carbon per occupant of the building uh, here in Vancouver, for sure, depending on the carbon footprint of your utility, it, it changes a bit. But And then the shark unit that, that we really haven't talked about before with the EPRI group is a, 
is a larger uh, centralized system where we can do large districts. So the piranha is made for any place where you're using a lot of hot water, hospitals, breweries, you know, the hospitality industry, laundries, uh, apartment buildings, uh, senior living, student housing. It uh, anywhere that people are using hot water to do, you know, daily functions like laundry and showering, etc. So that's what they uh, that's what the piranha looks like there on the left. It's a completely self-contained package heat pump. There's a compressor in there. Uh, so we use, a, we use a refrigeration cycle to move the heat. So basically, you use a, a benign refrigerant. In our case, we use 513A, which is one of the newer, low, uh, lower um, global warming potential refrigerants. Performs very well. And we can make right up to 140. 140, 150 degree hot water. We use in there a, a braze plate heat exchanger that's made to run potable water through it. So you don't have to, um, you don't have to use separate heat exchangers and stuff to be applicable. Mostly, excuse me, mostly used for domestic hot water. And we have them in three different sizes. So basically it's 2000 gallons a day of hot water, 4,000 and then about 6,000 made by our units. And we, we make them completely. And one of the great things we got to show off with the incubate energy test is that we have the ability to program the runtime on the, on the piranha. So we have a proprietary storage uh, method. So we maximize the storage capacity of your holding tanks. So on the, uh, on the Epri building, we tested with this unit, it was 60 units. Uh, 60 apartments with mostly family occupancy, so very good hot water usage. And the piranha was only required to run about 12 hours a day. So because of our ability to store the hot water, we could avoid running during the peak power time. So utilities that are, uh, are very conscious of their peak power usage were a very effective tool. And, and um, we also have on the unit very advanced uh, information gathering. So very quickly, we, um, we know the, the traits of the building. We know when people are using hot water, we know how much they're using, and we know how to make it on off peak times so that we don't have to have sort of on-demand hot water situations. So a very effective tool for avoiding uh, operations during peak times of the day. Very simple, quiet little unit sits in your mechanical room or in your parkade. Um, it takes up about the equivalent space of a, of a single parking lot. So if you have that much room somewhere in your building, and it doesn't have to necessarily be in the mechanical room, but it does, um, it, it does uh, recover all the heat. And because of the way a heat pump works, you move basically three units of heat and one, one unit of heat is produced by the operation of the compressor of the heat pump. So you never run out of energy because you always have more energy returning to you than you can use. So it's a perfect scenario. We don't care what temperature that it is outside. We don't, uh, we're not like an air source where the colder it gets outside, the less efficient the unit is. It sits inside, so you have a very long, long and reliable life cycle. Very, very little maintenance required because it is a prepackaged, pre-built unit that arrives there. So once a year, you basically you know take a hose and wash out the inside of the tank. So then we have um, we have this. So the average COP when you're making 120 degree water, for instance, is about 4.5. Uh, we found when we were doing the test with EPRI, we ended up averaging about 3.7 at 140 degrees. New low refrigerant, very, um, we're all NSF rated, uh, UL listed, CSA, all the requirements needed. So the Piranha HC unit is all of those things, and it'll give you free cooling and as well for the capacity of the unit. So 
what what that means is when you're when you're making hot water and you're doing simultaneous air conditioning somewhere in the building you're taking that waste heat from the air conditioning and you're putting that into your hot water so if you've got the lobby of the building or a meeting room or something you want to do up to about two or three thousand square feet it'll provide all of the air conditioning We have several um, we have several different um, operation methods because Legionella is a is a real threat these days and ever has always been I guess but we can make constant 140 to 150 degree water with the unit we can heat tanks and store hot water or we can operate just as a the demand hot water unit. So this is a, this is a typical installation. So if you look, um, you know, the tank is held, the, the sewage leaving the building is held in a small holding tank. Gravity flows right through the tank. So there's no interruption in the flow of the sewage. There's no way you can, you can plug your sewer line. It's all completely sealed. You know, one of the, one of the things most people notice right away is that they go into a mechanical room with a piranha system and you do not smell sewage. So um, we want we take great pains to make sure you don't because you know we don't want to pen, uh, penalize you for doing the right thing with a smell. So basically, the warm water about seventy five to eighty degrees when in, in the morning when people are showering and stuff, we just take the heat out of that enough to heat the hot water tanks. So the water always leaves the building at about uh, sixty five to seventy degrees. And we've recovered enough heat for the for the operation of the hot water unit. And you can see this this particular diagram shows the air conditioning uh, feature tied into your building condenser loop, or you can have a fan coil for air conditioning. Very simple stuff. It's just um, it's just we use water as a medium to move the heat around, and then you've got your domestic hot water. This is a, this is what the inside of the piranha looks like. It's two heat exchangers, the the sewage heat exchanger on the right, and it's just a refrigerated tank. So if you uh, if you think of a uh, you know farmers that milk cows, and I keep referring to farmers, I guess because I still think of myself as one. It's been a long time since I milked a cow, but anyway, uh, it's kind of like a bulk tank for milk. You fill it up with warm sewage, pull all the heat out of it. And then you put the heat into the hot water. So a very, very simple, reliable, and efficient way to move heat. And that's um, that's where we get the efficiency. And so the the sewage water might only be seventy degrees, but by putting it through that refrigeration compressor, you're able to compress that energy up to the one hundred and forty, one hundred and fifty degrees. So. I'm sure all of you folks are familiar with heat pumps, and this is just a very rudimentary, simple sewage heat recovery heat pump. Uh, used used in any application where you've got a bunch of hot water you need to make. And so, um, Annie asked me if I'd mention some of the some of the projects and some of the other stuff that Shark has done. So. Um, as CEO and president of Shark, I'm eternally grateful to. EPRI for really launching Shark into the into the view of of all kinds of people around the world. So, Annie and uh, Mark and Doug, thank you very much. And so, uh, the very first unit we built was capable of doing uh, much larger loads. And uh, so, for instance, we have a Shark system in downtown Vancouver that heats five million square feet of apartments. From the from the wastewater leaving downtown Vancouver, and it's being expanded to 20 million. So we make a full range of uh, full range of shark units, which are, are for a bigger application like District Energy, where they will make all the hot water, they'll replace the cooling tower, and they'll provide your heating. So it uh, it's a real good good way. What we've also been able to develop over the years is a way to thermal map your city. So we can work with the sewer department to really do a thermal footprint for for a city so you know you know the best place to best place to look for it. <clears throat> so that's what a 
That's what a system would look like um, leaving the shark warehouse here in Vancouver. We also operate in Bellingham, so we're uh, we're really pleased with the Made in America stuff that came out. And uh, so that that system there went into a 200,000 square foot building in Washington, D.C. So uh, one of the other great things about EPRI is it allowed us to interact with another company that was on the Incubate Energy Challenge called RWI, Synthetic Intelligence Company. And uh, Myrna, who operates that company, has nothing synthetic about her intelligence. The woman is brilliant and has developed a, a predictive method that goes beyond, beyond normal predictive analytics and artificial intelligence. She takes historical data and, and takes it and futurizes it. So uh, what we've been able to do working with Myrna is, is figure out how we can adopt on a much larger scale, predict energy, predict growth of populations, uh, effects of pandemics and uh, weather and all kinds of things on it. So that was just another great benefit of being associated with the EPRI group. This is how a shark works. We have a solid handling tank on the bottom left there. And uh, we take the sewage flow from the city. But with the shark, we have to remove the solids from that flow so we don't plug the heat exchanger. And uh, that's one thing Shark has developed better than anybody in the world is the ability to filter very large quantities of sewage. So we have uh, projects coming up, for instance, where we've got 15 to 20 megawatts of recovered energy, and we're flowing 40,000 gallons a minute of sewage. And the sewage is, you know, basically water and paper. And so to take that paper out of the flow was the impediment to other companies doing sewage heat recovery. So one thing I can certainly proudly and confidently say is we filter sewage water better than any company in the world. And we do that every day, 24 seven. And if, um, you know, Sylvia from Con Edison is gonna speak a little bit later, but. New York, for instance, has 1.4 billion gallons of sewage a day that runs towards their seven treatment plants. If we just recovered one degree from that 1.4 billion gallons a day, I think it's about 3 million gallons a minute you can recover in energy. And, um, and all that hot water goes into the oceans and streams of the world and actually probably contributes to global warming as well. So we did a study when we were doing the 735 building for the EPRI challenge of how much ice that heat that we recover would have melted. And it was equivalent to an American football field, 75 feet deep in ice that we save from melting by recovering the heat before it goes out into the ocean. And this is, this is a really exciting um, exciting application for us is that we can have a low ambient loop that supplies a district or a number of buildings and then they have their own heat pumps and chillers and stuff in the building but it allows you to um, allows you to share all the energy within that district first before you have to either import or export energy from from an entire district so we have a particularly uh, neat little project we're doing here in Vancouver now where we have 23 acres of development and every building is tied into the loop. And when we did the analysis, even here in Vancouver, there was more cooling required than heating. And everybody thinks that Canada is being a cold old place, but the world has changed with, with climate change because now air conditioning is more dominant Utilities are going to have more and more pressure to have electric uh, air conditioners running, but the efficiency of this is is enormous. You share the energy first, and then you import the, what you either need to get or what you need to get rid of back into the sewer line. So this one, uh, we do some districts like this where we distribute we distribute hot and cold water. Um, I live in a fantastic city uh, called Richmond here by Vancouver. We have, uh, we have the largest geothermal supply loop in the world. And we're now installing uh, a bunch of sewage heat recovery projects there for the core. So they're taking 
natural gas right out of the core of the city. Fantastic. Uh, the Mayor Brody here is a real visionary. And this, if you can imagine, is the inside of a shark. So that's a picture of the inside of a shark with the with the top removed, not clean, not sprayed off or anything. And that's uh, after operating for four months, 24 seven, black water going through it, some 276 million gallons of water filtered. And that's what the, that's what the filter looks like. So one thing we've done is become really good at filtering sewage. And again, we, we pride ourselves on our commitment to operating well and operating reliably. So we monitor every system 24 seven real time. So we've built in all kinds of analytics that tell us if anything is even trending towards a failure, the equipment itself emails the service guy. So on the right there, you can see Matt, our service guy is working on something. But if you can imagine the, the equipment in your building, do it giving you green energy super efficiently and maintaining itself is a real comfort. So I'm just gonna talk about a few projects here we've done. This one's particularly near and dear to my heart because it's in Washington DC for DC Water, the headquarters building started in 2018. It's about 150,000 square feet of office building. And we save about 85% on the heating, 35% uh, just on the efficiency gain of the air conditioning equipment and about 5 million gallons of water that would have been used for the cooling towers. But because we monitor that building 24 seven and we know whether it's heating or cooling or just what the equipment's doing, in Washington, D.C., where it gets pretty cold in the winter, the building is only moved into the heating mode parts of two days over two and a half years. So by sharing all the energy in the building, we virtually don't need heating. This is the uh, Southeast Falls Creek Energy Center. It's built under a bridge and it supplies energy and it's heat only on this one for heating and hot water. It supplies energy for 5 million square feet of customers right now, growing to do 20 million square feet over the next two years, and has a 10 mile long hot water pipe that delivers that, that high temperature heat to buildings. This building represents the largest carbon savings for the city of Vancouver. We currently have two of our Shark 880s in there, and uh, we're going to uh, grow that number significantly over the next year with five more going in. This is a really neat one. I saw my man, Ryan Green from Denver sign on. So perfect timing, Ryan. Um, in Denver, we have uh, what's going to be North America's largest uh, sewage heat recovery system, 3.8 megawatts uh, supplying about 250 acres of new redevelopment in Denver. Uh, we we put through about three thousand gallons a minute, but it's um, it's a it's a real uh, a real hallmark for the work there in Denver. Denver has kind of a unique problem. They've got about eight hundred million gallons of sewage a uh, a day there, and they have to cool it all down before they can put it in the river in the winter. So a perfect perfect way to use that heat is to heat. Uh, Heat that, and that particular site saves about 2,600 tons of CO2 in a year. This is our building we did the EPRI challenge in, and you can see that 60 unit residential building. Um, we reduce about 41 tons a year of carbon in a 60 unit building. One nice thing too is we collect so much information, the carbon credits are easy to verify and simply went into the mechanical room. And that's the one where the equipment only runs about 12 hours a day. So BC Hydro doesn't really have a peak problem. So we don't program it there, but we certainly can on other sites. And um, and we had a, a great 12 week run there with the, with the upper challenge. Another little building we did in Lake Louise, Alberta. 
in the in the beautiful Rocky Mountains, an unbelievable, pristine, beautiful location. The owners of the hotel wanted to show off their commitment to that environment, so they put in a piranha unit just to recover the the heat leaving the commercial laundry machines that do the sheets and towels there. So we make about 1,700 gallons of hot water a day. Because that water leaving the wash machines is so warm, uh, the COP is uh, 5.25 on that one. Um, we saved a tremendous amount of propane, which was the fuel they had there, uh, about $30,000 a year savings on a system. So very rapid payback. Wall, uh, Wall Central Park is um, in Vancouver as well. It's a combination of a small shark unit and a couple of piranhas for, <clears throat> for 1,050 apartments, uh, approximately 4,800 tons or 248 tons of carbon a year, offsets, uh, offsets a lot of the vehicles in the parking lot. And it's amazing now the millennials insist on knowing their building is green. And that become a, became a huge uh, issue when they were selling it. They were very prominently showing showing that they had a green building. This is a very uh, this is King County in uh, in Washington. They're the first community in North America to to have a, a recognized program to incent people to use wastewater as an energy source. So. They've gone through all of the um, all the rigmarole with council and stuff to approve the sale of energy from their sewer line. So, what they've been able to do is take what used to be just a cost for the city and use it to supply efficient electric energy to buildings in the downtown core. So very exciting. We've actually got uh, two projects approved and another one on the way down there. What I didn't know in, in Seattle was kind of neat is they heat the they heat the grass under the baseball field. So that was done with natural gas boilers. So it's now going to be done with the waste from there. So Boulder Commons, is a, it's a net zero building. And um, it's a very neat one that has a little piranha in it. And um, that's kind of the story of uh, of shark energy. And I'm going to let Annie take it from here and get Doug and Sylvia, but also available for any questions. But once again, thanks to EPRI it was a it was a game changer for Shark, and uh, we we truly appreciate it. And and we have projects going with a lot of the utility stuff we work with. So thanks, Annie. Might be muted, Annie. About that, thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, that was great. And I, I did see a question come in our chat from John. Um, says, fantastic project with great engineering, thought leadership, and novelty. Do you think there would be a big differential in sewer temperatures in different cities around the globe? And what is a best average or typical ROI? You bet. The, uh, the it's funny because the sewer temperature does change, but not as much as you might think. So, um, if you get a city that has combined sewers, uh, you might get down as low as uh, as ten degrees C, or around fifty five degrees C in the winter. But then you might go up to about seventy six in the summer. So it doesn't change much. It's it's kind of anywhere in the world, and uh, is about the same right around right around sixty eight to seventy degrees Fahrenheit. And the flows, the flows are uh, absolutely astronomical. If you can imagine in New York City, a, a billion and billion and a half gallons a day is is a lot of flow. So, the, and the ROI is is usually somewhere in less than five years. If you have uh, if you have a value placed on carbon like we do here in Vancouver, the payback is is traditionally much shorter too. So, we our government here has stated that. And the next five years, the price of carbon will be at $150 a ton. Right now, it's about 40 or 45. So um, the utilities here in Canada will pay about 50% of the installed cost of our system, and they buy the carbon credits for 20 years. So ROIs are, are somewhere short of five years usually. And then uh, utility-grade stuff, you know, they amortize it over 30 years, but the payback is much shorter. So. Uh, Thank you for that. I, I, and then a couple of uh, 
oh, here's here's another one. Um, is fouling on the heat exchangers ever a concern? Yeah, that's a great question because when I started building this, uh, you know, 11 years ago, I thought it would be a huge issue. We were so worried about heat exchangers and we, we use a plate and frame heat exchanger. So we filter product down to two mil, but we use an eight mil gap heat exchanger. But I assume grease and everything had eventually fouled it up. So we had we had all kinds of ports on there for steam. And we were gonna be able to clean these things whenever they were needed. Except in 11 years, we've never taken apart a heat exchanger. So I think because we pump from below the surface of the of the wastewater stream, <clears throat> we don't get the grease and stuff. So I can honestly tell you we've never had a heat exchanger fouled. So no, it's not a problem. But we also oh, have oh. A, we also have a very unique cycle on there where reverse flow and stuff. So so it's it's made uh, you know I'm kind of like what Einstein said there. I didn't fail at things. It just took me, you know, a thousand times to prove things didn't work. So we tried lots of different things, but fouling of the heat exchanger has been a very pleasant surprise. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and, and along those same lines, how is the Brave heat, Brave plate, sorry, Brave plate heat exchanger protected if a pump fails? Um, okay, I, I, I'm going to have to assume that is... Uh, that's on a freezing application. Well, yeah, we have all kinds of sensors on there that shut it off long before it ever gets to freezing temperatures. Right, so right. I assume that's what it is. And then we also have requirements for uh, screens before the heat exchangers. So again, heat exchangers just haven't been the problem I thought they would be. Fantastic. What? And I know um, Sylvia Corum from Con Edison is on with us. My Con Edison and Sylvia, and yeah, they've they've been a, a regular participant in our our weekly collaboration with Shark Energy. And Sylvia, if you're if you're on and available, would you want to give kind of your perspective on the project and maybe also <laughs> where it's going next for you guys at Con Edison? Yeah, Annie and Lynn, I'm I'm on and I'm available. Can you hear me and can you see me? Yes, ma'am. We sure can. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I'm listening to Lynn and I'm I'm just like thinking he got it everything. He got it going like from so many angles, like wastewater recovery, heat pump, electrification, um, agnostics and as a you know, AI agnostic, COVID testing. It's it's really interesting how to see how the company evolved. We've been involved on behalf of Con Edison, which is a New York utility with Shark and Epri um, during the Incubate Energy Challenge. And it's been a quite of a ride. It's, it's very pleasant ride. It's very uh, nice to see the results are uh, from the pilot. Um, we have very interesting results from a performance perspective. And if I am Personally, working on behalf of R and D, so we're looking up, we're fishing these type of. By the way, fishing is a good word for shark. We're fishing these type of innovation, innovative projects where we can get some piranhas <laughs> and um, install them in, in New York market. So I am taking a lead right now on behalf of Conet to take this technology and um, implement it in New York market. We have engaged um, energy efficiency teams, um, small and medium business, um, and also multi-residential. Two pilot groups that are looking for a site. We are particularly looking for something with a good load profile, um, multi-residential, very interested about the commercial laundry mats, and also something specific about Manhattan we have steam customers and our district steam system is is um is once through system so we don't have a condensate recovery on the district scale but each customer is if it's steam customer they have their own condensate so we thought that the condensate as opposed to wastewater could be also another great input um as you can see like the coefficient of performance and general performance of shark is depending on two variables mostly one, what is your desirable output temperature? 
and most of the buildings are 140 is good. Some of the buildings run at 120, even better for performance. And two, what is the inlet water temperature? So as Lynn was saying, the inlet water temperatures um, could be, you know, 68 time for around that, maybe sometimes higher, but um, higher it is a better performance and it's very much of an exponential. So that's why the thought process is if you feed it with a commercial laundry mat effluent or condensate, you are doubling your efficiency. So now you imagine you're running average electric heat pump is right now COP3, which is 300% efficiency. This unit on average been showing COP3.5. So in any given day, it is beating average electric heat pumps as it is. Now imagine you feed it with something higher than the normal temperature, like a commercial laundry mat, you are really achieving 700% efficiency at some point. So that's what we want to demonstrate in, in um, New York. We're looking to actually see what we're trying to find out is, I guess, three objective. One, does it really operate as it operated um, during the Vancouver pilot? Two, what is the true cost for this um, installation? What, what is the cost to tap in into the city line, tap in into the sewer line? How does it really add up to the owner's perspective, the cost of the project, not just the capital, but the entire installation? And three, we, we not only that we're interested to see the performance, but we also want to see if we can use the storage tanks to shift the electric load into the off peak hours. And, um, and I, I believe that's one of the features that system can offer. So if you can store the energy and then release it um, during the off peak hours, so the pump energy that is used is used during the hours when the rates are lower, I think ultimately that can really lead to the saving for customers from electrics perspective. And, and I, I think that's kind of where we are. I'm happy to take questions or ask anything, but that's, that's my spiel. <laughs> Thank you Thanks. so much, Sylvia. And maybe we'll turn it over to the group on the phone. Um, you can star six to unmute yourself. You can submit a question in the chat. Um, any questions for Sylvia or Lynn? Okay, we've got one here. Are municipalities ever concerned about lower temp wastewater affecting biological treatment plants? That's a great question, and I've I've heard a number of times. Um, um, and that's um, we had to do a test, and we did the downtown Vancouver site, for instance, where we're heating five million square feet with the waste from Vancouver. So we had to do a study that would determine just how much we would affect the downstream temperature. So what they determined is in uh, 150 million gallons a day that flows through that pumping station, that there isn't an instrument made in the world that can measure that low a temperature difference. And they determined we could do another 700 high rise buildings for heating, uh, taking the heat out of that sewer line before you could actually measure the difference. So um, if Shark is able to cool that water going to the sewer treatment plants, I'll be so successful, I won't be talking to you folks anymore. But um, no, it, it, it's, it's not an issue. And, um, and, the, and the, the astronomical size of the opportunity is, is, is you know, answered in that question is that there is so much heat thrown away that you know, you're not going to cool down the plant. And now, now um, EPA has dictated to a lot of these plants that they have to cool the water actually more before they can release it into the river. So Denver, Seattle, Tacoma, everybody on the West Coast is pretty much facing that issue. Uh, that's the case for New York as well. I just want to add it. We have to quench it up to one, 150 to release it. So that's additional cost for the customers if you have to quench Water. Yeah, the the Vancouver Steam Company is the largest user of fresh water in Vancouver because they have to mix cold water with the condensate before they can put it down the drain. So that saving alone, if we could recycle that heat, would be great. But but I was going to say to Annie that as a senior citizen, I I probably should be home in the rocking chair. But I've got 
three three beautiful granddaughters and today i've got a special treat to have two of my grand nieces uh, tuning in here but you know i've seen climate change myself i used to go in the arctic and visit you know these eskimo camps and doing refrigeration so i could sell you know ice cubes to eskimos literally but um, but now those camps are gone they're underwater and and Yellowknife, for instance, used to have 60 days where it was below minus 60. Now they had four days when it was below minus 40. So, so and geothermal loops, when I was in that business, used to run cold. Now they're all overheating from air conditioning. So it's a great opportunity to use something that people throw away. And then they give it back to the next day. So if you can, you can recover a trillion dollars worth of energy for 200 billion but you can sell it again for a trillion. So there's also a great social and business case. Uh, no kidding. Um, that's fantastic. I, I we've we've got another question here. Is this is the storage feature based on storing the heat of the sewer water or storing the heat on the hot side of the unit? Is there a requirement for a large tank? Yeah, there is, and both actually. We store finished water. That's that's really our key to to uh, programmability, and and then we also store sewage. So we have inertia on both ends of the uh, thing. So we're doing that district in um, in uh, out by University of British Columbia, uh, twenty five acre development has two uh, forty two ten thousand gallon tanks, forty thousand liters. So these tanks are not super huge. They're not millions of gallons. They're in you know tens of thousands, and they're buried, so you never see them. Any other questions from the group? Actually, I had a quick question. Can can you give us an understanding on how much electricity does this consume? Yep, you bet. <clears throat> so the 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 EPRI challenge, for instance, um, was using about 10 kilowatts per hour of electricity on a 233 phase feed, but putting out uh, you know three and a half times that. So um, so the the draw is somewhere between 10 and 15 uh, kilowatts out and then and then obviously three and a half times or in and three and a half times that out so the the draw is relatively small for a building and traditionally if you had an air source heat pump their system would be three or four times as big as ours to do the same sort of work um, and then you know air source has defrost and climatic issues and stuff so um, yeah the the draw you know 10k uh, 10K in, 35K up. Not that much. Thank you. Yeah, so it's not a big service. Like, you know, it's 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 a 60 amp breaker. All right. So we've got two more questions, Lynn, that have come in. Um, or Sylvia, are shark installments completely dependent on electricity or can it be self-sustaining? Um. <clears throat> Uh, we need electricity to to operate. So what we've what we've looked at a number of times is on a net zero building, for instance, we've sort of equated the electrical use to how many solar panels you'd need to offset it. I don't think you know I don't know about electricity, but I don't think you can use it directly, Annie, to to run it. But you can sure offset it very easily. So it's a real tool here. Passive uh, passive built standard is the new uh, standard in BC. So by reducing your amount, uh, and you can't use gas, so by reducing the draw on your electrical, you're able to offset it easier with solar panels. And I think that's what they do. Okay, great. And then we have another question from Caleb at the Knoxville Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for joining us today, Caleb. Um, says, Lynn, thanks for your presentation. What is the strongest example um, with a recent project of an ROI for a community that shark that a shark system was implemented in. Um, well, let me let me just think what the strongest would be. So, uh, probably DC water is the best uh, is the best example. So, 
John Fossum at Smith Group Engineering had to do a 25 year life cycle cost uh, analysis of the building. And he, he compared it to business as usual, geothermal, uh, you know, sewage heat recovery, whatever the other options were. Uh, sewage heat recovery proved to be the lowest life cycle cost. But when you look at the cost of the building, I think our system was maybe $300,000 to install there. The, the savings on water, electricity, and, and, and just general energy was probably a couple years real payback. So that's a, that's a great business case, but they are also the greenest building in, in North America at that time. And I think probably still is. So they had a, you know, they had a, a mission. They were going to be green. We were the lowest cost green. So you could also make the case that it was an immediate payback. So, but just on operations, probably a couple of years is the fastest. And, you know, 10 years, 10 years would be very unusual to be long. It's usually, you know, four, five, six years at the most. And thanks, Caleb. We'll see you soon in Knoxville. Great. Hello, Lynn. We've got a lot of, oh, here we go. Is uh, This is from Vic. Um, Lynn, great stuff. Is there a provision for energy capture from the hot water? Um, Maybe does I'm not sure what he means. Uh, is that provision. this electricity or? Vic, do you want to unmute yourself and maybe ask your question? Yes. Hi, Lynn. Uh, what I'm getting at is much like a a combined heat and power unit, uh, like a micro CHP unit. Uh, when you when you are recycling your water and you know in, in the in the drawing that. Uh, uh, your presentation, I viewed uh, the re recycling of, of, of the water. And with that, can you capture the heat and convert it to uh, energy for reuse in the uh, no. process? No, unfortunately, Vic, the, the efficiencies of, a, of an ORC unit, the organic rank and cycle unit, are probably somewhere in the 10 to 12% range. We we only you know we only recovered about four or five hundred percent efficient, so you'd be losing you'd be losing on that equation. Uh, I'm I think there's going to be a day when <laughs> an ORC unit is better, and then that would be a great equation. Yes. Yeah. I, thank you, Lynn. But we're that's what you know, Vic. That's what makes us really work is we're such a simple technology. We we take heat, we move it, and you know. And I I fell in love with the geothermal business years ago, and uh, and that, I loved the idea that you just moved heat around. And then and then after twenty five or thirty years in that business, I thought you know how am I going to get that water out of the sewer line? Turns out it's easier, uh, way less infrastructure. I was on a call the other day where they were going to do a hundred unit apartment building in New York City with geothermal. The cost was $10 million to get 80% reduction in carbon. 150,000 with a piranha, you can reduce your carbon by 50%. So the, the gap, uh, you know, we're, I'm convinced, uh, you know, uh, that we'll be very, we'll be very busy in the, in the short term here and the long term. So. You know, I've always uh, I've always said I'll just become successful in time to die. So it's going to happen any day, either one maybe. <laughs> Vic, are you talking? Or are you on mute? Sorry, uh, late nights. <laughs> um, in your uh, absolutely, I totally agree with you, Lynn. And in your presentation, you touched on the tremendous amount of gallons of water that are being moved around. Um, and where, where I was going with this is uh, our technology, we've just uh, integrated a CHP unit where we do, uh, 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 the, the, the unit converts the excess heat into energy and we re 
Yeah. That's bricks and uh, that's a great uh, idea. Trump and challenge. Uh yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a fantastic a great- opportunity if you can, yeah. your solution can capture that. Yeah, we we did a, a combined heat and power system <clears throat> with our system over in Scotland, and um, and we it's called Sterling, and we had uh, the the first minister of Scotland, kind of equivalent to the prime minister, or the president, stand in front of our unit, saying what a great idea it was, and I don't think she had any idea that you know there's sewer cursing through the lines there just a foot from her, but. But yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm just a, I'm just a technology nut. I, I love all good ideas, and you, yours is a great one. All right, and thanks for that. So we've got one more question um, from Dave Hatherton. Hi, Lynn. Forgive me if this was presented earlier. You sent me a comparison between Shark and Geothermal on a project which showed an approximate 10x savings on capital costs with as good or better performance. You may have just touched on this. Yeah, I did, Dave. And Dave, Dave's kind of a neat guy. He's he's the Good. guy that really invented geothermal or didn't invent it, but he certainly brought it to the forefront. Um, you know, Dave, that's that's what I'm seeing is that ten times reduction. And uh, and Dave is a, Dave is an unrecognized genius. I love that man. And humble to boot. Yeah. <laughs> well. Thanks, Lynn. So, <laughs> thanks for your great questions today. We've got just a couple minutes. Um, are there any final questions? No, so I'm just going to say a little something. In, in Toronto, um, which <laughs> that's new. Uh, loops going in, and that's the corner of the now. I, and I, I'm looking at this 10x thing, and it's been haunting me because uh, these are all right downtown, and uh, they're drilling under buildings. And if, if there's a, if there's a way to avoid this um, at, at 10x and get the same performance, um, yeah. there's no reason you wouldn't retrofit every building. Now. It just you know it, it makes a lot of sense, especially on on the heating side. They have a lot of the cooling side kind of hand. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Well, I think we'll wrap it for today. Um, huge thank you to Lynn, to the Shark team. Um, it's been a great, was a great project last year. Uh, thank you to the supporting utilities of the Incubate Energy Lab demo and, and the utilities that supported this project, Ameren, AEP, Con Edison, um, Southern California Edison, and TVA. Um, and thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today. Sylvia, uh, thanks so much for always being a willing participant to share your knowledge and expertise um, with folks. So uh, thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. So with that, we'll wrap it up for the day and we will see you um, next month. So stay tuned and thanks again.